Okay, so I'm talking to uh, Buzz Baum. Buzz is a professor for uh, cell biology at the Laboratory for Molecular and Cell Biology and at University College London, although he's actually moving up to Cambridge to the LMB in June. Buzz's interest in his lab span from cell and tissue morphogenesis to the evolutionary origin of eukaryotic cells. Uh, Buzz, thanks very much for taking the time to, uh, to talk to us this afternoon. I'm sure it's all pretty busy. Um, just to start out, can you just tell us a bit about your history with these BSDB, BSCB, GenSoc meetings? Um, What's been your involvement with the societies in the past? What do they mean to you? Yeah, so first of all, it's a pleasure to join you. Um, yeah, so I used to be on the BSCB committee, British Cell Biology Society uh, Committee, and um, and organised some meetings uh, myself. And I always really liked it as a UK community meeting where, um, of course, there's great science, science and scientists from around the world, but it's really a chance for um, students and postdocs from the UK to meet each other. And for example, from the LMCB, we always um, had our students come to those joint meetings and they went every year in their little gang. And it was one of the first things they did as a group. And so it yeah. was really one of the times when they started to feel like a group and part of a wider community of cell biologists. So for me, it's really the community aspect that I thought was most valuable. Yeah. And uh, what were you particularly looking forward to at this year's meeting? Um, yeah, there were, I mean, I always, <laughs> were they going to be dancing? There was always quite a good party, actually. <laughs> There's going to be dancing anyway. Put our Spotify playlist on in the kitchen part. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I, think uh, I, I always like, again, because it's a community meeting, I think things like poster sessions, talking to people about their work is always um, one of the pleasures of these kind of local meetings where you really can talk to the people who are young young scientists students and postdocs who are going to become maybe future leaders in cell biology development biology in the uk that's really um i would say is a good thing i would and, look forward to yeah and uh, you were going to be the the grand finale of this meeting you were scheduled for the for the final talk uh, on wednesday so just... i was subbing i was <laughs> Uh, tell us what you were what you were planning to to talk about during your your lecture on Wednesday. Yeah, so um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I thought that because it's a finale, uh, I, well, it's not really a finale. I, I I would be planning to talk. The thing I would have talked about was um, our sort of rethinking the eukaryotic cell, and so in some way, it's not you know it's not development biology, it's not it, it's not really genetics, but it's but it's, um, I think, for me, over the last few years, um, thinking about where we come from is obviously something that we all like to do, but actually trying to be scientific about it and find where eukaryotes did, really did arise and how they arose um, has been sort of the focus of our work. And I think it's sort of uh, one of those fundamental questions that probably until you're, <laughs> I think, before I became a professor, it might be um you know sort of thing that you could lose your job for <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit wacky but um but actually uh in the in the last few years starting with my cousin and i uh, wrote yeah. this paper in bmc biology about um, a theory paper about how um you could have got from two simple cells an archaeal cell and a bacterial cell how those working together could have given rise to this eukaryotic cell with all its complexity and of course what's amazing is that eukaryotic cells across the whole tree of life from plants to animals to silicates to fungi they all have a nucleus endoplasmic reticulum peroxisomes you know microtube organizing centers actin motors all these things they share and it's enormously complex and there are very few or none no examples where you have a sort of simple intermediate so there's always been the question of how does it come about and the idea for a long time was just that there was an, a cell that swallowed the mitochondria, which was a sort of bacteria and became the mitochondria. And it didn't eat it. It swallowed it, didn't eat it, learned to live together and became eukaryotic cell. And uh, sort of following on from conversations with my cousin, who, who sort of pointed out that this didn't really make much sense, we, we sort of worked on this idea that what might have happened is an archaeal cell which is very much like the archaea we, we knew about on planet Earth, 
um, which essentially simple cells, but they often generate like vesicles and protrusions and things like that. So they might have um, in a biofilm might have been together with these bacteria sharing resources and through attachments, through protrusions and through learning to live, live with each other and, and benefiting from this mutualism, they might have had a sort of growing intimacy and then given rise to the eukaryotic cell. And what was really nice about that for me is that when we, when we sort of drew the pictures of the intermediates, we realized that there are very few simple steps you need to get from simplicity to complexity, which was really kind of quite surprising. But there were a few things you do need. And so we started thinking about what they were. And so that happened in 2014. And since then, my lab tried to do <laughs> lots of crazy experiments to try and test the idea. But of course, yeah. this happened a long time ago. And so it's really hard to think about ways where you prove whether this model is true or the other model, which we call the outside in model where you swallow something as we call the inside out model which is true but in 2015 the etima group discovered this creature called loki which is an archaea which um has many features in terms of genes that we thought make us special like it has actin and active regulators and it has escorts pathway and ubiquitin and, and other things and so we started thinking about what uh, you know what that might look like, and could that be similar to our one of the one of the sort of parts of the model, the first stage in this growing symbiosis? Um, but unfortunately, nobody had seen it. And then just this year, in in Bio Archive and then in Nature, this paper came out where they had the first pictures of Loki. Yeah. And what was cool is, first of all, Loki is a symbiont, so it has to live with other organisms, and it shares resources just like we imagined. It's definitely an archaeal cell. Yep. Um, and it has protrusions a bit like in our drawings. So um, it really does, to me anyway, look like it could be quite similar to one of these early stages where an Asgard, now we think Loki, which is part of the Asgard Archaea, one of these organisms um, could be the starting point um, through symbiosis um, and, and a stable symbiosis that got established um, could, could be the first step in the path to eukaryotogenesis. Um, and so you... I think, I mean, obviously that data on, on Loki is still pretty new. Are there potentials to be able to culture that and to actually start working experimentally with it? Well, so it took them 12 years to, yeah, to get I, to Yeah, I know that, yeah. And, and of course, because it's not, you can't have a pure culture because it has these symbiotic partners. I mean, you could probably substitute them, but it's going to be difficult to work with. Also, it comes from the bottom of the seabed at four degrees, so it grows incredibly slowly. But what we realized, which to me was really exciting, is that, is that, so many people were speculating what does Loki look like? And we, we thought it looked like an archaea when we looked at the genome. And we published that in this review um, a while ago. Um, so we thought it looked we thought it looked like a sort of archaea and a TAC archaea. And TAC archaea we have in the lab already. Right. So what we've been doing recently is sort of thinking like that maybe we can use TAC, which are culturable, we can do molecular genetics to, to sort of study this transition now. Yeah. So we know in a way that we have TAC, we have Asgard, like Loki, and we have us in a sort of, in a sequence where TAC look more like normal archaea, Asgard look in between, and eukaryotes are clearly, you know, probably emerge from an Asgard-like archaea with a, with a mitochondria, with, a, with this bacteria. So what we've realized recently, looking at the cell biology of these TAC archaea, which haven't been well studied because they grow at 75 degrees centigrade in sulfuric acid, um, but by studying their cell biology, we've learned actually there are lots of things that are very similar to us. So, and other groups, I mean, have, have really played this a similar role in showing that. So they have a cell cycle, like our cell cycle, which is ordered, but they have no CDK cyclins. So we mm -hmm. propose in our paper on bioarchive that probably the cell cycle came first, CDK cyclins came second. And we also have discovered, which I would have presented, a role for the proteasome in resetting the cell cycle. So the end of the cell cycle in our cells, yep. the proteasome resets the cycle by destroying cyclins. Mm -hmm. It turns out that in, in archaea, in TAC archaea, which are related to us, they also use the proteasome to reset the cycle. So but we really want to look at that in more yeah. detail because that's oh. exciting. And that's the other thing we did is we built a microscope that works at 75 degrees centigrade where we can now image them as they divide. And that just started working in the last sort of six months, Andre and Dell and other people in the lab, the whole team spent, in fact, probably 20 people <laughs> put years of work and finally it, it's working now really well. And we've got a very nice paper on Barcode, which I'm very proud of too, where 
we study how they divide. Um, um, and I think it, they divide using escort three, which is a machine that our cells use to divide as well. So again, there's something these archaea do that looks simple, completely different to us, but actually they share some of the common machines that do the key events in the cell cycle, like division, and some of the regulatory machinery, which decides when you yeah. divide. So the more we learn about them, the more I'm thinking that the clues are there. We don't, you know, the Asgard thing is probably going to be a bit in between, but we may not learn much more about the cell biology of archaea. Maybe we'll learn more about the evolution of symbiosis that led yeah. to us. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. And so you just said, you know, your, your, your lab seems to be doing a lot of exciting work right now, but presumably um, I'm talking to you at home. Are you having to shut down the lab through the coronavirus pandemic? How are you coping from, with that? Yeah, that's really, I mean, everything is being <laughs> reassessed every minute of every day. Um, I actually would be very happy to retool and start to do <laughs> PCR tests for coronavirus, um, but uh, I've offered, but we haven't heard back um, to do that. But um, many people in the lab, I mean, I think the lab is also a home for many people who are like foreign students and postdocs. Yeah. And so I think it would be a real shame if we shut it down completely, because what are these people going to do? They're going to go into isolation um, yeah. by themselves, which is a lonely thing. So I, I really hope that the building is, as a whole stays open. And also, so that's one thing I think would be a good idea. We have to keep also liquid nitrogen and the yeah. flies. Like if we lost all the flies, that's <laughs> decades of research. You lost the cell, cell lines. That's yeah. again, decades yeah. and decades of reagents that can never be replaced. So that, keeping that going is absolute priority. Really? Um, but I have encouraged people who don't need to be in the lab to work at home. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who are, who are, would like to be there working hard, are well, and want to finish papers and things. And they're still um, at the lab um, working away and I'm supporting that. But all the lab meetings we're doing, we're going to do our practice on Thursday. We're going to do online. So again, mm -hmm. we include everybody. We also include people who aren't in the lab yet, but are going to come. So oh, that's nice. quite a nice yeah, yeah. opportunity to actually have more people involved. We'll see if it works. Um, and yeah, and, and maybe working at home is quite good to be. I also, actually, also the other thing I told people, um, which I want to do for myself, is that part of the reason everyone's worried is because the whole, everything needs to come to a standstill. And we're terrified of a standstill. But actually, it's quite good to think and to read yep. and to pause. And so I was telling everybody, you know, maybe we can spend a few weeks and it might be months <laughs> <you Yeah. know, laughs> reading carefully, thinking hard, you know, um, uh, even if we're not writing a paper or writing a thesis, actually getting to grips with our subject again, I think is um, it would be worthwhile. And what I learned in the evolution stuff is actually just by thinking, you can make quite a lot of progress if you're structured yeah. and you and you read the literature. And, I think that's a really uh, sort of positive message to to get across as well, that there are some potential benefits to this situation. And I know that you've also been thinking about um, what this might mean for conferencing. Obviously, we're not recapitulating the BSDB GenSoc meeting online, but we are getting some aspects of it. And do you sort of have thoughts on how that might translate to also when we're thinking about reducing our carbon footprint and so on? Yeah, so in some way, yeah, a bit um, ironically that I was actually I'm going to be chairing the ASCB EMBO meeting in 2020 in Philadelphia. And when I was asked to do it, I really wanted to try to have a way that people could join by remote so we could stream parts of the meeting. And EMBO, in particular, Gerlind Wellon, who's the EMBO YIP person who runs that, she's been very supportive. And what we're trying to do is set up, we'll see if it still happens at the meeting, but we yep. were trying to set up local hubs where people, instead of traveling to the US, could actually travel to a local meeting, present posters and stuff, and still have the plenary s sessions there. Because um, I think ASCB and EMBO meeting, that is quite good to be a World Cell Biology Day. Yeah. You know, yep. meeting Where people who from Iran who can't go to America can also participate. And I think uh, there are a lot of benefits one could get by doing it online. And also recently, uh, I helped to organize a meeting in India, and we did a very nice mentoring session online because I couldn't go and I did it all um, via remote and in some way I also offered them that because I wasn't going I said um, I would happily do a mentoring session with every single postdoc student who wanted to wow. 
online <laughs> that nobody took me up on it. But oh, I would have happily done it because at the same time I was on, you know, it takes to fly though, I could have talked to every single person about do they have questions? I mean, not that I can necessarily help, but so I think by doing things online, we can actually, there are some things we can probably do better online than we can do in person. Yep. And I think, for example, talks, I think are fine streamed. What meetings are about is about going for walks and having lunch together and all those things. So in the future, I'd happily do meetings where the talks are online, mentoring things are online, but we go to a place and we all go for a walk. <laughs> and then you really get to have this other kind of interaction that you can't do so easily online, which is, I think, really valuable. You build relationships, yeah. friendships, collaborations uh, under those conditions. So I think maybe this is a good chance to experiment with um, these new ways of working, some of which will be better for the planet and maybe also better for us as scientists and people who will uh, work together. Cool. Thanks very much, Buzz. That's a really good positive note to end on. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us. My pleasure.